Happy Easter, everybody. My name is Pastor Kenny. It is always wonderful to celebrate with you guys. And I, I, I just am one of those people who loves being a small church. And sometimes at a small church, there's things that you can do that maybe you couldn't do in a big church. There's plenty of things you could do as a big church you can't do as a small church. We don't want to like uh, uh, worry about that. We want to celebrate the things that we can do. And so last uh, Sunday, we got to baptize um, some, some of our beautiful people. And there's a little connection. Um, we got to baptize them across the street at the Graham's house. And it happens that yesterday was Chris Graham's birthday. Isn't that awesome? And at her house, we got to baptize Avril. And it happens to be Avril's birthday today. And so... One, two, three, four. Happy birthday to you. Cha, cha, cha. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, I still, I want to say I still got it, but now we know the truth. All right. All right, so get some Easter resurrection eggs, wonderful thing. Um, To change the subject, um, I got a little spoiler alert warning this morning. Um, This comes from what some might call a prophetic voice on the interweb. Um, His name is Christian Dude with Sign, and the spoiler alert is he's not dead. He's not dead, everybody. And how did that guy know that that was going to be the topic of my sermon this morning? That's the mystery. Some things um, are just better left a mystery, right? Um, On a more serious note, there's a new Bible translation. I don't know if you guys know, um, for the young, the youths of our day called Gen Zers, the Gen Z uh, Bible translation. And so as we kick off our Easter sermon, I want to see uh, maybe how how well you guys speak um, Gen Z, and these are some, some, some real verses that were translated into Gen Z. It's good to translate the Bible into all the languages so that you can reach all the people groups, and they've done that for Gen Z, praise God. And uh, so here, I'm going to give you this Bible verse from the New Testament, and I want you guys to see if you can guess what Bible verse it's translated, and if you can guess, you get a resurrection egg, okay? All right. The first one is this, W, to those who take L's from this life, for they will receive an everlasting W. <laughs> who knows what, uh, what that's a translation of? Any guesses are welcomed. I'll, gi- I'll, give, you, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you, has anyone got it? Beatitudes. That's Beatitudes, very good. There's a lot of them. Is it more specific? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one for trying, brave soul. Whoops, sorry, bad thrower. I can't throw back there or close, right? I can't even hand off. All right. So W's, it, it means win or winners or wins. So wins and L's, losses. So wins to those who take L's from this life, for they will receive an everlasting win, is blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5.5. 5. <laughs> All right, one more. W, you know what that means. Now, W to those who don't throw hands, for they will secure the eternal bag. (laughs) Who knows that one? Any guesses? Who's got a guess for me? Blessed are the peacemakers. They don't throw hands, for they shall be called the children of God. All right. For those of you guys who, who uh, don't speak uh, Gen Z, uh, we'll do just some standard Bible trivia for you guys. Okay. What is the only miracle that is recorded in all four of the gospel canon accounts? What's the only miracle that is recorded in all four of our gospels in our, in our biblical canon? Yes. 
Turning water into wine is a wonderful miracle. It's the first miracle, but it's not in all four. Yeah. Who said that? All right. You get candy. Yes. The feeding of the 5,000. Where are you? I still got it. Oh, terrible. Terrible. I, I, need, I need right shoulder surgery again. All right. All right. Feed, feeding of the 5,000. Now, here's the next one. You guys didn't see that up there. If you did, then don't do it. What, what, uh, what Old Testament Bible verse is the feeding of the 5,000 and a reenactment of? It's a prophetic reenactment of what? Anyone know? The manna in the desert is a good guess. Actually, the prophet Elisha fed 100 men with 20 loaves and some grain. And so when Jesus reenacts that, he's, there's, there's a prophetic remembrance of like, hey, something is happening here that is, has been predicted of long ago. And this comes from 2 Kings 4, uh, uh, 42 through 44. So this morning, the reason why I kind of opened this way is because I like to have some fun, but also we're going to be in John chapter 6 this morning, which isn't a story about the, 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 the resurrection and the tomb. It actually is a story that happens much earlier in Jesus's ministry that, that we'll see points forward to this idea of, of what resurrection uh, actually is all about. And so the context this morning for John 6 is Jesus has just fed 5,000 men plus women and children. I heard someone say the 10,000. That's great. That's good Bible scholarship. It says 5,000 men and women and children. We estimate there was probably maybe 10 to 15,000 in total that Jesus is going to uh, uh, feed. And he feeds them with one little boy's sack lunchable, right? Two fish and five small barley loaves. And interesting, the, 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 the uh, apostle Peter had a brother named Andrew. And Andrew does three things in the New Testament. He, he brings Peter to Jesus, which is a big deal. He also later is going to bring some Greek people to Jesus. And in this story, he's the one who brings this little boy to Jesus. A great ministry, bringing people to Jesus. And so... Imagine Jesus has just fed 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people in this small village, and he's on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is trending, everybody. Like if, if you ever imagine like there's a TikTok video going around and everybody's seen it and everybody's talking about it and they just want to see more of it, right? And they want to talk more about it. That's the kind of vibe that Jesus has going on. And so Jesus uh, performs this miracle of feeding the 10 to 15,000 on the east side of the Galilee. And then he, his disciples get on a boat and they travel back to Capernaum, which is on the west side. That's kind of their, their home base where Peter is from. And Jesus isn't on the boat initially. And so this is when Jesus walks on water and they end up together on the other side. And there's a huge crowd waiting for them, as you can imagine, because he's trending. And, and, uh, and that's when we're going to enter into our text this morning in John chapter 6. The crowd is waiting for him, the, him after, after this, these wonderful miracles. And so usually what we do is we have you stand up when we read the text. I'm not going to do that this morning. But the reason why we do that is just to kind of get our bodies and our minds and our attention attuned to the fact that we're going to read God's word. So I'm not going to have you stand up. But I would ask you to just kind of lean forward a little bit. And engage with this wonderful story. It says, Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God? They asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God. 
that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? They asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Amen. So first things first, I love the reminder as we gather here for Easter, which is known as Resurrection Sunday, that we have this very real and very encouraging hope. For all of us who believe, we will be raised with him. We will be raised up with Jesus on the last day. And the season of Lent, as I'm learning, I didn't grow up celebrating Lent. Maybe some of you guys did, and that's wonderful. What's up, dude? (laughs) Yeah, he's excited. (laughs) But I didn't didn't grow up excited like that about Lent. (laughs) Just bringing water to the world. But, uh, but as, I'm, as, I've been, as we've been entering into Lent, what I'm really realizing is that Lent is a season that is an annual period of 40 days. And it, it, it doesn't near, merely count down to the annual Easter Sunday. It doesn't just 40 days coming up to this year's Easter. But it is a sacred journey. It is an intentional pilgrimage of our souls that we enter into and embody. And it's all pointing towards a culmination of our faith, which is a final resurrection. In other words, every year we're reminding our souls that our souls are longing for something in the future that will come to pass on that last day, that final Easter when God resurrects us with him. And the rhythm of Lent is beautiful like this. And yes, it teaches us these wonderful and reminds us of these wonderful Christian truths that yes, Jesus did die on the cross to atone for our sins. And yes, Jesus did rise from the dead on the third day. And also Jesus did promise to come back one day and to make all things new. And the, 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 the idea was from this, the book of Genesis, when he, when he makes everything, what did he say it was? He said it was tov. That's the Hebrew word translated good. And it's this idea of a perfect state in God's eyes, the way things should be. As we look out at the world, as we walk through the world, we all know intuitively things are not the way they should be. And yet they were at one point, and they will be again. This is the hope of Lent. Lent's not merely a season to mark the days leading up to Easter, but something to enter into that is supposed to mark our souls as we await something wonderful in our sure and and secure future hope. And that is what we celebrate on Easter morning, Remembrance Community Church. Lent prepares us for Easter, which is a revelation of the hope that still awaits us, of promises 
that are still to come. And an assurance that the good God who's always faithful and always on time in his timing will be back. He's not dead. And he's coming back again. In sin, in sin this world has spiraled into a decay. It is not the way it should be. The Bible says that sin has brought death to this good creation. And, if, and it will also need a resurrection. His creation will need a resurrection. And that's exactly what John the Revelator in the last book of the Bible describes in the last chapter, which I want to read for you, and I invite you to lean in. He says, in, at the end of our text, he goes, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. And then in Revelation, we see the last day. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, for those of you who are surfers, this is not saying that when we get to heaven, there will be no tasty waves. This is actually a reference back to Genesis 1. If you read through the creation account, there was, there was the sea, and it was, it, it was, it was unformed. It was formless, and it was, it, the darkness hovered over the seas. In the Bible, this represents chaos or disorder, right? So before creation, we have this chaos represented in the sea. And then God forms it, and it is good. It's tov. And then we see when sin enters, the chaos returns and it starts to unravel it. And so when the, John the Revelator says, the sea will be no more, what he's saying is that chaos will be no more. Then I saw the new heaven and a new earth. But first, the first heaven and, and, and the first earth will pass away. So there's a death and there's a resurrection of his good creation. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I always thought of the last days of us going up to heaven, but here it says it's coming down to us. Well, that's, that's beautiful. It's prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. By the way, if anyone ever says, what does the Bible say heaven's like? That's your verse. That's your verse. What is heaven like? I don't know exactly, but God's dwelling will be with us. And that's what makes it heaven. And he will live with us. And look what it says. Imagine the culture that you're, we're used to in this world, right? Pain and sorrow. It's all gone. He wipes away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. There's a death. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. There's a resurrection. This is the, what the Bible says about God's plan for a resurrection on the last day where we will be raised. Grant Osborne writes a great commentary on the book of Revelation. He says, From the moment Adam and Eve lost their place in the garden paradise, the divine plan and all of Scripture have been focused on the moment when sin will be eradicated and God's creation can return to its original purpose. That's what Easter's about, everybody. So what does this mean? What does this mean for us? It means that the resurrection is more than just a historical fact that we look back to. It is that, praise God. But it is also a divine plan that we look forward to, that we're going to be a part of. As Jesus says, for all who believe, I will raise them up on the last day. It's a beautiful promise. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 if you guys are reading along in our Bible reading plan, today's reading was 1 Corinthians 15. I encourage you to go read that. It describes all of these things in great detail about the resurrection and what it means for our future hope. 
It's beautiful. Paul does a great job. And he says that the resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits, meaning there's going to be a greater harvest. And we're going to be a part of that. That's the idea. The first fruits is a pointing forward to a future resurrection that we will all experience all of us who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And he concludes chapter 15 with this exhortation. He goes like this. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor is not in vain. To believe in biblical terms... To believe means to hear something, believe that it's true, and then, and then enter into that in obedience. When, when, when Jesus is saying, you guys don't yet believe, they're trying to figure some things out, but they don't believe he is who he really is, and they haven't gotten to the point where they're really to, to follow him and obey him. They just want him to do tricks. And he's like, tricks are for kids, Right? And so the idea that we like to say at Remembrance Community Church is that faith or belief is when we believe in our hearts that following Jesus is the best possible plan for our life. And then we reorient our lives around that conviction. To believe in the surpassing worth of following Jesus above everything else. And then slowly over time, it takes a, a, it's a lifetime journey of reorienting our lives towards that conviction. Note in John 6 text, the text for this morning, the people have just experienced a miracle from Jesus that fed them in a field. It was a momentary blessing. A wow factor. And now they want more of him. Give us more. Show us another sign. What sign are you going to give? Anybody read that and just go like, are you crazy? They just, like, what are you talking about? The reason why you're here is because he's trending because of a sign. And that, they just want more. And then they point back to Moses who, who, who gave them bread over and over again every day for 40 years. That's what we want every day for 40 years. We want more. We want more of that bread. And we see a bunch of signs that these people, they, they, they haven't seen the surpassing real worth of Jesus. And they need some serious reorienting. They need a different perspective of who Jesus is. They, they need, they need their, their minds changed. And Jesus tells them, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever hunger. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. I want to give you more than what you're asking is what Jesus is saying. I'm ready to give you something more than just food every day. I'm willing to give you something that will satisfy actually deeper at the level of your soul. And I would say this is some gangster preaching. I might expect the Gen Z translation to say something like this. And then Jesus said some gangster stuff about him having the riz. And if you eat this double-double... You'll never have trouble, and your Stanley Cup will always be full. <laughs> I know, that's so stupid. Now, Bible nerds will tell you, Bible nerds will tell you that Jesus in this conversation is actually pointing them to a rich prophetic word that came a thousand years before him in the Hebrew scriptures in the prophet Isaiah. What Jesus is doing is they're pointing to Moses, which is wonderful. They're pointing back to Moses because Moses said one person will come, a Messiah will come who will be greater than Moses. And, and Jesus is saying, I am that person. 
Notice they go, Moses gave us bread, and he, and he corrects them. He's trying to reorient them. He goes, actually, technically, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. God gave you bread from heaven through Moses. And now I'm here from heaven, from God, sent from God, and I am the one greater. In other words, Jesus is saying, I, yes, I am fulfilling Torah. Torah is the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote. Moses represents Torah. I'm fulfilling Torah, but also I'm fulfilling the prophets more than you're asking. They're pointing back to Moses and the Torah, and Jesus is like, yeah, I am fulfilling the law and the prophets. In Isaiah 55, and when I read this, see if it doesn't resonate with what Jesus is saying. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water, and you without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good, and you will enjoy the choices of foods. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. You see how Jesus is pointing back to Moses, and he's fulfilling, he's fulfilling Torah. And he's also fulfilling the Isaiah prophecy that one will come, and this will be the message. And the correct response... <laughs> The correct response is believe. See the surpassing worth of following this Jesus and trust him enough to just let go of everything in your old life. Don't, don't buy the bread that doesn't satisfy your soul. Follow me. I'm the bread of life. Reorient everything around me. It's worth it. It's better for you. It's why I came. And he goes, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So I can't emphasize this enough. To believe is seeing the surpassing worth of following Jesus and then committing to reorienting your life, apprenticing with him, following him in real time. Becoming more like him all the days of your life. That's what it means to believe. And he says, if you do that, I will raise you up with me on that last day. And in, in our text, Jesus actually offers what I would say uh, is two juxtapositions uh, of response. Two different ways that you can respond. How to live this out. Two what not to do's. And, and then followed up by two what to do's. He says, don't try to satisfy your soul with earthly treasures. Anybody like me ever tried to satisfy your soul with this earth's bread? He says, rather, come to Jesus and make him your treasure that satisfies your soul. And then he says, don't try to earn your salvation with works salvation. Come to Jesus to be your savior and trust in what he did on the cross. You can't satisfy your soul with the bread of this earth. It's taken me a lifetime and I'm still in the process of trying to figure that out. Sometimes, as many of you guys know, I work for the fire department as my main gig, and uh, I wish sometimes you guys could be a fly on the wall on the fire engine. You would hear some of the most fascinating and interesting conversations. Last week, one of the guys on our crew was talking about the latest news with Sean Puffy Combs, the famous uh, rapper and hip-hop star, and I guess he's been accused of some really dark stuff. Right? The FBI is involved, and it looks really bad. It involves human trafficking, which is gross, and a number of sexual allegations and crimes. 
And the takeaway on the rig, the guys that were on the rig with me, the takeaway was that having all the money in the world can't satisfy your souls. Which is interesting because only one of them is a Christian. Besides me. I'm a Christian too. I wanted to clarify that. <laughs> and, and it went on. Like it's remarkable. It's a remarkably consistent throughout history, right? Kings and queens, celebrities and billionaires, all the earthly power, money, all the treasures and pleasures that this life offers, the bread of this world. And yet so often they end their lives in despair, loneliness, brokenness. Think of Alexander Great, right? The great Greek uh, 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 empire. And he took over the, the world, right? He changed the world forever. And dies in his 40s of loneliness and alcoholism, right? It's just over and over again throughout history. And the takeaway is, don't try to satisfy your soul with the bread of this life. And Jesus says it really, really clearly. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life. Isaiah said it, why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? The uber quotable C.S. Lewis said it like this. He goes, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable expl explanation is that we were made for another world. John Calvin, the reformer, said that our souls are like perpetual idol factories. We just cre keep creating things to chase after, new bread to try to eat and feed our soul with, and it never works. It's idolatry. Something that is trying to fill the void that only God can fill is an idol. And that's what he's speaking about. And this is a good reminder for us who might consider ourselves just average Joes, Right? We're not billionaires or kings or queens. And yet the same truth is true for all of us. And it's not a sin to enjoy the good things around us that aren't sin. Right? Good friends, good food, having fun with your friends around food, like at the Dodger game. Amen? If anyone wants to invite me. <laughs> Only if you're a billionaire these days, right? Right? But nothing in this life hits like Jesus, as the Gen Zers might say, right? Nothing in this life can fill the longing that our souls are longing for. These people run all the way around the Sea of Galilee to get one more bit of bread. And Jesus is like, really? So much more is available to you. That's what you want? If you had to choose a, 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 a Jesus filling your soul or a piece of bread filling your your, your pleasure for the moment, you would pick that. But these things will never ultimately fill our souls. And lastly, you can't gain, we can't gain our salvation through works righteousness. He says, what can, they, they said, what can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. And Jesus re replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. You can't, you cannot earn your way to eternal life. That's the message of the gospel. Eternal life is a gift that is offered from God. Just like, just like Moses couldn't give you bread from heaven, he could offer you bread that God gave him to give you. And I can't save you, but I can offer you the message. God saves. And we can turn to him for salvation. As the reformers put it correctly, we are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. So he says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, Jesus is not saying something new. He's not. He's saying something ancient and prophetic. Since, since sin entered the world, God's had a plan. He's been on the move, bringing salvation. The salvation story started as soon as the people needed salvation. 
And yes, it comes to culmination and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And he's not done. That's the message. Matter of fact, in Isaiah 55, continuing on the passage we already looked at, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Now, the ancient Hebrews believed that earth and heaven are two realms. We've lost this theology. It's, it's good theology. The earth is the realm where, where God created for humans to dwell. And heaven is this realm where, where God dwells. That's the way they would have looked at it. And, and, and they're not like, like you leave here and you go over here. They're, they're, they're realms that at times heaven and earth can, can, can sit together. Where God dwells with us. When God dwells with us, heaven and earth. And they called, they called moments in time thin spaces. Spaces when it felt like heaven and earth, like earth is, heaven is so close to earth. The temple was a thin space, a place where you could go and, and draw near to God. Jesus is a temple, right? Jesus is this thin space. When he says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call to him while he may be near. To the ancient Hebrew, that's a thin space. He's, he's here now. He's here with us now. Some of you guys may be sensing he's here with us now. It feels like, like normally the, it doesn't feel like this thin of a space between God and me, but now it does. He goes, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the simple one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so, may he, so he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive. It's a free gift. I want to invite the worship team back up. My uh, mentor named Paul told me the way to bring a conclusion to a sermon is to just ask the question, so what? Why does this matter? I sincerely hope this morning that this has been an encouraging reminder. Or maybe you're hearing it for the first time. But for all of us, it's at least an encouraging reminder that Easter is a time to look back and celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross and the victorious moment when he rose from the dead. And it is also an opportunity for us to look forward in hope and anticipation that Jesus will come back and he'll make all things new. I hope this gives us hope as we look forward, as we wait for his second coming, and the fact that for those of us who believe, as Jesus said, we will be raised again with him. I hope that we also see that this is incredibly relevant and impactful to the way we live our daily, day, daily lives now, of reorienting ourselves, praying like Jesus prayed, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's those two realms coming together, right? Jesus prayed that that would happen. He tells us to live as if that is happening and to pray hoping that will happen. And we live in this tension between the alreadiness of Jesus coming the first time and the not yetness of him coming and making all things new. And we live in the mess. We live in the, in the tension. But we live with hope. We, 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 don't, we don't have anything as those who have no hope. We do everything as people who have hope. And maybe there's some of us this morning who came with a burden on your shoulders. Came with a burden on your shoulders. Maybe you've been chasing the satisfaction of your souls with this earth's bread. And there's an invitation from the Lord in this thin space this morning just throw that away and chase after something better, which is Jesus. Maybe you're tired of carrying these burdens and chasing fool's gold, and this morning is a day you make a decision, either for the first time to say, I want to follow Jesus, or maybe you've decided long ago to follow Jesus and you lost your way, and this morning you're going to get back up again and say, you know what, I'm back on track, I want to follow Jesus. For any of you who feel that way, we want to invite you as we're worshiping to make your way to the back and we have a team that would love to pray for you. Just go back and say, you know, I want to, whatever it is that your, your, your heart's uh, uh, stirred to respond towards and they'll pray for you. For all of us, I want to end with this passage 
And then we'll enter into a time of worship. Come everyone who is thirsty. Come to the water. And you without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And call to him while he is near. It's a thin space. And let the wicked one abandon his way and the simple one his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will freely forgive. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word that from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between, from, from the law to the prophets to the gospels, everything points to the fact that you love us, that you want us with you, that you have not given up on us, that you sent Jesus to to, to pay the price and forgive our sins. We can't, we can't do that on our own. On our own we fail. But with you we can be victorious. I just pray that you would help us to walk in that victory. This morning, pray that you would help us to walk in that victory all the days of our lives. And we just thank you that we have that secure hope that one day there will be a last day and on that last day, for all of us who believe, we will be raised with you. We look forward to that. Amen.